morning. There we go. Um, wow. Good job, guys. Thank you uh, for the band. And that was really great this morning. Thank you, guys. Hey, let's give it up for the band one more time this morning. Well, today's scripture reading comes to us from Psalms. Love Psalms. And it's kind of interesting because every time that uh, Pastor Scott has me read something out of the Bible, um, that it's, I find that I've highlighted it sometime in the past for s whatever reason, and this is one of them. Psalms, one, Psalms 19, starting at verse 7, we're going to read. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eye. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are truer. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also track your servant, also back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Bless the reading of his word this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the strength that it gives us, the wisdom that it unveils to us, the enlightenment that encourages us. Father, let your word this morning seek, seek uh, that we seek your word strongly this morning, but that it sinks deeply within our soul and our spirits. That, Father, that you would uh, just continue to minister to us through your word. That your word is our, is our life. It is, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And that, Father God, that... Uh, it brings us comfort in times of trouble and reassurance that you are God, and that there is none other, and that you love us unconditionally. We thank you, Lord, for this. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning, church. Good to be with you. Good to sing. Good to read. Looking forward to diving into the scriptures. Uh, note real quick, Norm's birthday today. Happy birthday, Norm. I had a cake uh, all ready to go. Fire marshal said there was not that much fire allowed in this in this building. So sorry, buddy. Um, next time. Well, is that is that is that deep? Did I cut did I cut you deep, Norm? I love you, buddy. Uh, thank you for your prayers for Lori. I appreciate she's slowly turning a corner. Not a hundred percent yet, but um, so far uh, it's improving versus going the other direction. Thank you for loving our family, for providing meals for our family. Uh, I think the next request is maybe gym membership to work off all the calories. Uh, you guys are awesome. So thank you for, for taking care of us. And uh, she should be here second service so you guys can love on her yourself. And uh, turn in your Bibles to uh, 2 Timothy chapter um, 3. Comes after 1 Timothy if you need a little help with that. Um, today we get to dive into the, the Bible, to talk about the Bible. Tons of verses coming your way. Um, Great quote from Bill Maher. Now, Bill doesn't have necessarily a lot of good quotes. He's not necessarily a fan of Christianity or faith or spirituality. Uh, but he has a great quote that I think I I it stings when you, when you consider it. To most Christians, the Bible is like a software license. Nobody actually reads it. They just scroll to the bottom and click, I agree. Amen? It, it, it hurts, doesn't it? When I first heard that, I thought to myself, ouch, but yet... The reality of it is it's so, so true. We are called to be people of the word, and yet we neglect the very thing God has given to us to meet him and have relationship with him. 
And as a spiritual discipline, this ought to be the most important part of our spiritual lives. It is the word that permeates every aspect or should permeate every aspect of our lives. It should influence and impact all the decisions we make and our behaviors and and our attitudes. And yet, I think like the prophet Amos wrote thousands of years ago, there's a famine of the word of God in our land. And recent statistics show us, I'm going to show you a few charts, because there's some of you out there that like this kind of stuff. So put on a bib and start salivating, because here we go. How much of the Bible have you personally read? Notice 30%, several passages or stories, and then it just gets worse from there. None of it, 10%. All of it, more than once, only 9%. All of it, 11%. Almost all of it, 12%. I mean... These are not good numbers. If you think about how much of the Bible people have dove into, what what about the next chart here? It says this. It's which of the following describes the Bible? You know what? 52% say it's a good source of morals. You know, it's got some good stories in it. It's got some good principles. It might as well be just a collection of fortune cookies. Amen, right? It's a historical account. It's helpful today. It's true. It's life-changing. It's a story. And yet it gets worse, outdated, bigoted, harmful, not sure. Um, this is people's perception of, of the word. How about the next research shows, why, do you, why have you not read the Bible more? That's an interesting question. Uh, number one, we don't prioritize it. And why do we not prioritize it? I'm going to be the guy at the end of the day that says we're just lazy. We're just lazy. Uh, how about I don't have the time, right? Uh, don't, I don't, I've read enough of it. <laughs> you know, Been there, done that. Yep, I've had enough. Uh, I don't agree with what it says. Okay, that's good. That's honest. I don't see how it relates to me. I don't read books. Well, good luck with that person, right? Uh, I'm intimidated by the size of it. Who wouldn't, right? Um, I don't own a copy, which is interesting. I went through my house, and within a span of about 20 feet, I found 8 to 10 Bibles. How about you? you? If you looked in your house, how many Bibles could you find? And yet, one of the most... Intense quotes, Charles Spurgeon, Prince of Preachers, right? He said, so many of you have copies of the Bible that you can just pick up any one of them and write damnation on the dust cover of it. Whoa, oh, that, yeah, that's not good. How about the next one? Now, this gets into the realm of, of pastors, right? In what ways, if any, do you encourage your, your congregation to read the Bible on their own? Now, I got to tell you, I welled up with a little bit of pride on this one because you know the centrality of the word here at Missio Day. You know the importance of the word uh, and how much of a, of a premium we want, we want to put on the word. Uh, we provide reminders and sermons. I mean, how many times have I said, write this down and read it this week, right? Take notes. Uh, we provide free Bibles to those needing one. Right there on the table on your way in, you didn't know there were free Bibles. And you don't just have to have them here. You can take them with you. They're free. So make sure you grab one if you don't have one. Uh, have Bible readings during worship services in addition to sermon passages. Norm did that today how about provide a printed reading plan uh we have those we send it out electronically at the beginning of every year if you want to have a plan where you go through the bible in a year we put that out there i'm going to repost it this week for for those of you that want to do that we provide reminders on social media such as facebook or twitter provide reminders by email or email newsletter provide a digital online reading plan matter of fact there was a time and i don't know if it's still true josh on the app the 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 app for missio day you can pull up the Bible reading, and it did kind of a year reading plan on there. It still does that? <laughs> Yay. You guys, number one, didn't know we had a Missio Day app. I mean, how cool church is that, right? We got our own app, and there's actually a B- Bible reading plan. So if you search Missio Day, Apple App Store, Google Play Store, whatever, whatever, uh, it's out there. So, uh, And as pastors, just so you know, it doesn't get better when you pull pastors, though. A few years ago, pastors were asked which of the following statements most accurately reflected their view of the Bible. Listen to this. The Bible is the actual word of God and is to be taken literally word for word. 28% pastors. That's one-fourth. And I'm going to tell you something right now that I have frequent interactions with people where they will say something like, you know what I enjoy about this church community? You guys actually open the word. Which makes me go, what the heck is everyone else doing? Right? 
Like what? We have come together to gather as people of the word. What is going on out there? And I'll be honest, as I've been in between ministries and have seized upon opportunities to visit other places, I have been to places where they have not cracked the word open. They may throw a verse up on the screen, and, and it, in, in that it's out of context. Or you walk in with a Bible and people are looking at you like you're walking in with a bag of poop or something. Right? Like, what is that? No, seriously. And I'm going, we wonder why. We wonder why we as a culture are experiencing all the difficult pangs and pain. Because we are not the people of the word that we're supposed to be. The same survey about the pastors, the Bible is the inspired word of God, but not everything in it should be taken literally, 47% pastors. The Bible is ancient book of fables, legends, history, and moral precepts recorded by man, 21%. There's a very low esteem for the word, and it's not just the church, it is those who are called to a vocational ministry, men and women who call themselves pastors. And I'm going to tell you guys, this is the most important discipline we can embrace. Can I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to hit this time and time again. This is the most important discipline. As we talk about the spiritual disciplines, and last week we did the intro, this is why we're talking about this first. The word is the most important discipline, and there is no substitute for the word. There's no New York Times bestseller by so-and-so pastor or so-and-so spiritual you know, guru. The Bible is it there is no substitute now i may lose points on my fantasy pastor draft in your world for for saying this uh you guys don't know about the fantasy pastor draft okay well maybe you need to google that later so there is no healthy christian life apart from a steady diet of the milk and meat of scripture all right this morning get your pens and pencils ready because we are going to give you a smattering, a plethora, a cornucopia of verses to substantiate what I'm describing to you today. If you leave here today and still have excuses, it is on you. I have a responsibility before God to once again instill within this community the importance of the word of God. Because this is the most transforming practice the most, most life-changing discipline we can embrace as God's people. And this is the most important thing to look for in a church community. I talk to people who are shopping for church, which is an interesting phrase in and of itself, right? And I love the fact that churches get Google reviews and Yelp reviews, too. Like, how's this one doing, you know? Like, here's the fact. If the church does not take you to the word, that is not a church, if the church is not taking its people into the word, into a passage, into a section and saying, what can we do to understand this? That is not a church. You might as well gather for bingo or bunko or bimbo or whatever. You know what I'm saying? You might as well just get together for some other reason. I will tell you expositional preaching the kind that we do here for the most part where you dive into the prophets, you dive into Genesis chapter 1 through 11, you take the people there, that is central to any God-honoring church community. Amen? So when you look for a church, I don't care how good or how bad the music is, I don't care how good, how bad the children's ministry is, I do care about how important the coffee is, but it's not that important compared to does this church unequivocally unashamedly go to the word of god amen and i will go to my grave preaching this because god sees that my heart as a teenager you go and you share the word with people can i tell you when i was called to ministry 15 years old i was called to ministry i didn't know what that meant what that looked like, all I did is I surround myself with godly men who began to shape me and disciple me. And all of a sudden, it was at the age of 18, God said, you will spend the rest of your life explaining the word to people. And that has been the trajectory of my life for 30 years. I love it. 
I'm honored that God would call me to do it. It is my passion. It is my joy. And every Sunday, I look forward to being with you to do exactly what God has gifted me to do. So thank you for allowing me to do that. And thank you for being a church that wants to sit under this kind of instruction to submit yourself to the teaching of the word. If all I'm doing is showing you how I'm submitting to it, for better or for worse, we have God's word given to us and we are called to place ourselves into it and under it. We have bookshelves full of Bibles, but yet there's a spiritual immaturity in the church that's got to be addressed. Amen? Pastors need to do a better job. Because what we affirm here is that a disciple of Christ believes that the Bible is the word of God and has the right to command our beliefs and our actions, and it has the power to change our lives. Five points, and we're going to go through this fast. So get your Bibles ready, get your pens ready. Can I make a note if if I forget, I don't want to forget to mention this. You need a good study Bible. Bound by leather, pages in it, digital copies don't count. You want to know why? Because I don't want to share something where I'm getting a text message. I don't want to share something when I'm getting an email alert. I don't want to get something when I realize that I'm in the middle of pouring over the word of God and Amazon says, I just delivered your package by your front door. You need to invest in a good study Bible where you have in and of itself the word of God. There's no distractions. There's no playing with your hearts or vying for your attention. You need a good study Bible that you can write in and highlight in and color and make notes in. You need a Bible that has been with you for so long you get it rebound. I've had this Bible rebound twice. And it's still falling apart. And here's a good word. Someone once said, The Bible that's falling apart is evidence of a life that's not. Tweet worthy. That's not mine. Don't don't associate. I heard that from somewhere. And that's all. Pastors rarely come up with original material. We're We're just quoting or citing somebody else. If you want a good study Bible, go get an ESV study Bible. You go get an NIV Zondervan study Bible. Those are two great Bibles that is worth a $50, $60. I have a premium calfskin ESV study Bible valued at $250. I don't bring it here. I don't trust you guys. (laughs) But I tell you what, you know, that is like, you know, it's one thing to have nice soft leather, right? And just because I sleep on it at night might be weird. Don't, nothing happens via osmosis, all right? Just because you sleep on the Bible doesn't mean you're actually being permeated by it, all right? But you need a Bible where you take notes in and like you see the highlights and you see the writing and you see the pictures and you see the notes. And like Norm said, you sent me the passage to read today and I went back and I had it highlighted and it was there like I had been there before and it meant something to me. Who knows a year or five years ago, you need to invest in a good Bible and digital copies don't count. Okay, because I don't want the same thing that God's going to use to speak to me to be the same thing I play poker on. Amen? That's my, now I may sound, sound Baptist or I might sound like a stodgy legalistic person, but that, that's me. The word of God is to be cherished. It is to be treasured. It is to be held in such regard that we don't use it as the very thing that we're te- texting little memes. And I love good, a good meme. The Bible is separate and sacred. Amen? Five points. Here we go. Are there five points in your notes? Okay. Number one, the Bible and spiritual prioritizing. Let me just start by saying there's two things we need to consider as we dive into this. Number one is that there needs to be intentional feeding. We need to be more intentional about our approach to the word. We must realize the importance of it, make it a priority, and it is possible even for the busy of us, busiest of us, there is no excuse, right? We talked about lame excuses last week. There is no reason why we cannot prioritize the Bible and begin a process of systematically feeding upon the word. And notice the word I use, systematically, there needs to be a plan. This just doesn't happen. You have to prioritize it. 
Notice Deuteronomy 32, the, the, the word of Moses to the people. He said to them, take to heart all the words by which I am uh, warning you today that you may command them to your children that they may be careful to do all the words of this law for it is no empty word for you, but your very life. And by this word, you shall live long in the land that you're going over to the Jordan to possess. So notice the, the emphasis on how important God's word is. It is your life. And we have to understand this. Look at the words of Luke chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus himself says, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. There is not only a hearing, but there is a, there's an obeying. There's a submitting to it. And here we have Moses and Jesus saying to us, you need to be intentional about this because intentionality leads to informed living. We need to be informed in how to live our lives on a daily basis. There's not one part of your life that's not to be informed by the word of God. We need to be informed when it comes to our marriages. Amen. We need to be informed when it comes to our kids. Amen. We need to be informed when it comes to our, our uh, uh, money and our jobs and how we treat our neighbor and how we, how we pursue justice and yet with humidity, humility and humidity. That was weird. We need minds programmed by the word of God. What does that mean? It means every area of our lives needs to be informed by the scriptures. There's not one part of us that not, is not to be informed. Every part of who we are needs to be profoundly influenced by God's word because you cannot be profoundly influenced by that which you do not know. Right? If I don't spend time with my wife, I will not know my wife. Sure, on paper, I look married. But in reality, you ask me, how's my wife doing? I don't know. I haven't talked to her in three, wa three weeks. You'd be like, that's weird. And so we need to be informed. Someone once said, the heart can't love what the mind doesn't know. Read an interesting premise the other day. What if all of our copies of the Bible had disappeared and someone could only piece together the Bible based upon what we post on social media? So Twitter, Instagram, Facebook... What you have is a smattering of singular verses surrounded by flowers, surrounded by a heart. Maybe there's a cross in the background. Maybe there's a sunset in the background. But all of a sudden, you piece together the Bible ju just based upon what we post on social media. You have a Bible that is deadly and dangerous. See, what you have is you have people grabbing onto partial truth. You have people that only want the good and don't want the parts that warn us and exhort us. Think about this. It, it's perfect squares are, are friends to Proverbs and promises and partial quotes, but those kind of passages and those kind of memes comfort but rarely convict. They emote, but rarely exhort. They warm, but rarely warn. They promise, but rarely prompt. It moves, but it does not mortify. It builds self-assurance, but balks at self-examination. Think about it. We all want to love God and love your neighbor. But none of us want to consider others as more important than yourself. Am I not right? What we have is a picture of our spiritual hearts. That we just, we just want that power verse. God help Christian radio. Please, if I hear one more power verse, which oftentimes is taken out of context, I will scream. That's why I don't listen to Christian radio. Because not only is it giving you power verses, out of context, it's giving you music that has no deep scripture saturation whatsoever. Can I go off right now on Christian music? Because we can do better. There was a day when I was saved and I got into Christian music. Now, this is back in, okay, I'm, I'm dating myself. This is Michael W. Smith, Amy Grant, Petra. That's like, that's old school. I might as well be saying Bach. 
Handel, Beethoven, right? Like, but you know, what's, uh, you know what was awesome back then? As a young believer, I was listening to that music, and you'd get a cassette. There's this thing called a cassette tape. I should have a picture of it just to show you guys what it looked like. But you open up the liner notes, and every song, when it came, and I remember specifically a group called Petra, every song had at least eight to ten Bible verses below it to support where the verses came from. And as a young believer who not only was an aspiring garage rock star, but I had a heart for Christ, and I really liked the music, and more importantly, I liked the message, I could go to the Word. And the music served as me deepening my understanding of the word of God, of salvation. Today, you're hard-pressed to read a lyric and go, where's that found in the Bible? Seriously, my wife showed me a song the other day, and she goes, I really like this song. I listened to it. I laughed. I said, you've got to be kidding me. You might as well pull this out of the Bible of Oprah Winfrey because there's no biblical substance to it whatsoever. We can do better. Amen? Amen? And I take great issue with Hillsong, and I take great issue with Bethel. A lot of it is about emotions, and little of it is about scripture. You want good music? Listen to Sovereign Grace music sometime. Sorry. I just went on my soapbox, and some of you are highly offended. Get over it. Here we go. Number two. The Bible and spiritual reliability. Let me just give you why we believe the bible is the word of god why it can be trusted why proverbs chapter 30 verse 5 is true every word of god proves true and he is a shield to those who take refuge in him three things you need to consider when it comes to the word of god there's the doctrine of revelation there's the doctrine of inspiration there's the doctrine of illumination first this we don't need to scroll through we'll go back doctrine of revelation God has revealed himself to us. This is mind-blowing. This is life-altering. The fact that God would reveal himself, not just in creation, because Romans 1 says that God has made his power known, he has made his wisdom known in what has been created, but that is only general revelation. That is enough to tell us there's God, but it's not enough to tell us and convict us of our sin and show us that there's a Savior. This is why special revelation is important, that the Bible is really the Word of God, and who best embodies the Word of God biblically than the person of Jesus Christ. So not only do you have the Word written, you have the Word personified. Think about this. Jesus says, you want to see God? See me. If you want to hear God, listen to me. Isn't it cool that some of us, like, we may not like to read, therefore he sends Jesus to be the embodiment of the word. And so what we cannot miss is that God has not left us uninformed. He has given us his mind He has given us his word. He has given us his will. He has given us all we need pertaining to life and godliness. That's what uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 says. So we need to consider the fact that we have been given a gift. We've been given his revelation. Romans chapter 15, Paul says this in verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Thank you, Lord, that you have not left us without a word. Our God is not silent. And he has given us what we need for life and godliness. A.W. Tozer said this, the Bible is not only a book which was once spoken, it is a book which is now speaking which is how powerful God's revelation is. It's not archaic, it's not antique, it's not ancient, it's not something, well, that's good because it meant something for them 3,000 years ago. It is living and active and relative to our lives today. It's not just for satisfying curiosity, it's for changing lives. This is why God gave us his revelation. Number two, it's inspired. Meaning, 2 Timothy chapter 3, look in your Bibles, because I hopefully, hopefully you turned there like 10, 15 minutes ago. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. For all scripture, how much of scripture? All. All means all, and that's all all means. Just remember that. 
is breathed out by God. Literally breathed out, inspired. That's what that word means. It means it's been breathed out. It's the very breath of God and profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man or woman of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. It is given to us by God, breathed out from his heart to ours so that we can now live according to the ways he wants us to live. Amen? It is given to us. And this is why the word is so powerful and has changed countless millions of lives throughout the ages is because it's unlike any other book. I even hate to use it that, that term, book, because it's, it, it's more like a, a love letter from, from the Almighty to us, and we'll talk about that more here in a bit. Last point, the doctrine of illumination. This is why none of us who know Jesus are without excuse, because he has given you the tools to understand what he's written. Now, granted, some of it may require a lot more work, amen? Sometimes it's easier to go to a psalm and go, wow, that makes sense, versus dive into Zephaniah, right? Some of you are like, I don't even know where that is or who that is, but it sounds really spooky and scary, right? Here's the thing. Illumination is a work of God in the believer's life so that not only can we understand what God's saying, but that we can apply what God's saying. Matter of fact, write these verses down if you would. Look at them on the screen. John 16, 13. The promise of Jesus to the disciples is this. When the spirit of truth comes... He will guide you into all the truth. For he will not only speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. One of the work of the Spirit in our lives, and if you are in Christ, you have the full baptism of the Holy Spirit. You have the full embodiment of the Spirit in you. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. You are fully baptized by God. You have the Spirit of Christ within you. And the work of the Spirit is to help make sense of God's revealed word. Why is this important? Because Paul addresses the fact that the Bible is a supernatural work. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, notice what Paul says here in this, this, this passage. The natural person, meaning the person that is not saved or doesn't believe, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. How many times have you talked to someone who doesn't know Jesus, you've shared with them a verse, and they kind of laugh at you? They kind of scoff at you, like, good for you, that has no permanence or presence in my life whatsoever. But he is not able to understand them, because why? They are spiritually discerned. We don't approach the Word as if it's just a book of literature like Charles Dickens, but we approach the word understanding this is God breathed to us and without the spirit, we are unable to understand the truths. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one for who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. <laughs> have you ever thought of your spiritual life in those terms? that you've been given a new mind, and your mind is not your own. It is the mind of Christ. And Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, let your mind dwell on these things. And so we need to understand that the doctrine of illumination says you have the very same spirit that I have, and none of us are without excuse in understanding the word with the spirit's help. If the Spirit is not involved, you'll have a difficult time. Has anyone ever been there and tried to do that without God's help? It is folly. 2 Timothy chapter 2, here's what Paul says. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Again, Spurgeon said, the amazing thing about the Bible is that no one ever outgrows the Scripture the book widens and deepens with our years. As a young believer and someone called to ministry, I thought to myself, boy, I'll be able to teach the Bible within a few years, and then it's like, what, what do I teach after that? 30 years later, I continue to go, wow, God, there is so much here. And not only that, I'll go back to a text and be like, how many times have I read that I've not seen this or not understood this? This is the amazing thing about the Word of God. It is living and it is active and it is ever speaking 
continually to us. Point number three, the Bible and spiritual awakening. There's two things we need to consider here. Number one, there's the powerful nature of the word. And secondly, there's the relational nature of the word. Let's talk first about the powerful nature of the word because only the word of God can change a person's life. Meaning, only the gospel of Christ can turn one from being blind to one who now sees. Only the word of God can take a hard heart and turn it soft and develop any sort of sensitivity to the things of God. Only the word can do this. So what are we thankful for? We're thankful for the word that where we are powerless to convince someone of Christ, the word itself pierces, changes, convicts, and converts. Think about Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Paul says this, without hearing, right? You will never, ever come to know God. For if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And the next verse that is supposed to happen, which I didn't give the sound, the, the, the tech guys, is this. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, okay, And that hearing has to contain the word of God. If there's no word, there's no change. If there's no word, there's no conviction. If there's no word, there's no conversion. And this is the beauty of the word. Thank God it's not left in our hands to change people. Have you ever tried to change somebody? It is a fruitless endeavor. And yet it's the word. When ministered to somebody has this amazing precision like a surgeon's scalpel to change where you were powerless to do it, but yet God's word did it. James chapter 1, verse 18. Here's what James writes. Of his own will he brought, brought us forth by the word of truth. How did God bring us forth? By the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. How about Peter? Chapter 1, verse 23. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. How have you been born again? By the word. This is why it is tantamount for us to be people of the word. This is why there's probably a lot of people who have a lot of false security. They think they are saved, but they're not because they were never truly changed by the word. Ladies and gentlemen, This is an indictment we must make upon the church that I who work for the church am not proud to admit, but we have a lot of people living with a false sense of security, and it is our job to make sure that they love Christ more than they love how healthy their marriage is or how well they're raising their children. Those are important, but what's more important, you knowing Christ or you having a happy home. But the word is also powerful when it comes to internally what we have to deal with. The word is powerful in us even overcoming sin because all of us, we get dirty during the week, don't we? We pick up the world's filth. And I mean, how many times does Paul like, look at Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. He says this about our hearts, right? The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Right? Here's the battle of sin. That Paul's very honest about. Indeed, it cannot submit to God's law. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So what is the agent that cleanses us? What is the agent that brings us to conviction? It's the word. For the mind that's set on the spirit is what's pleasing to God, Paul will ultimately say. And so it is a powerful, powerful resource that God has given to us. And if we neglect it, we do it at our own destruction. So there's a movie that came out a couple of years ago, Everest. Anyone see the movie e- Everest? Josh, Josh Brolin? Yeah, no one saw it? Good. Okay, that's probably why it failed at the box office. Good job, you guys. So true story, team climbing Mount Everest, right? And uh, several men, women lost their lives attempting to climb Everest. But the story centers around one of the guys who died named Andy Harris. He was an expedition leader. And the whole movie is basically premised on this idea that Here's this guy climbed this mountain, mountain of mountains, 
And he died when he didn't really need to die because the very thing he needed at that high altitude, oxygen, was available to him. But because he had lacked the oxygen, he became so disoriented with the canisters that were in his very hands that he died when he could have connected the canister and had fresh oxygen for his brain. And I sit there and go, how true is this spiritually of our lives where we hold within our very palms of our hands the very spiritual oxygen we need and yet we're dying because we're not sucking on it. Ladies and gentlemen, the very thing we hold in our hands is absent in our brains and it's ravaging our capacity to recognize what we need and yet it's right here in our, our grasp. So yes, it is a call to this very powerful thing that God has gifted us with. And we wonder why things are failing us and why we're experiencing all these difficulties because we're neglecting the very thing that's going to give us life and hope and joy. Which is why the relational nature of the Bible is important. See, we don't approach the Bible like an encyclopedia Or a textbook. Who likes textbooks? Who likes spending money on textbooks? What a right? They're important when it comes to education, but the Bible is so much more than that. The Bible is given to us so that we can have a place to be and to breathe and to hear the voice of the Almighty invite us into intimacy. Can I tell you, God will not meet you anywhere that is separated from his word. Think of the word as God's meeting place where he wants to speak to you and share with you and sing with you and just dote over you as one who is loved by him. Think of the word as that, that, that place where God says, I don't expect anything else from us but to commune with each other. And God help us if we fall into a pattern of using the Bible as a tool to accomplish utilitarian purposes rather than experiencing what God has there for you. This is a danger for any pastor. That all of a sudden I become one who teaches the Bible and I could teach the Bible and I could be a good teacher of the Bible. That doesn't mean I'm connecting at an intimate level with the Bible. How difficult is it for me to realize that part of my vocation is to teach the Bible to you, and how many times do you think it happens where I go through a week and it becomes a utilitarian exercise, divorced from my heart connecting with the Almighty? Has that ever happened to you? Maybe you've been a part of what we call accountability groups, right? And you know the question those guys are going to ask you is, how have you been doing in your time in the Word this week? And you answer and say, great, because you've checked off a box and you've read, but you haven't really read. If we truly connect with God in an intimate and relational way, we will become a changed people. I firmly believe this. Because it's about two things. Write that, these words down. And I, and, I, and I stole these two words from John Piper. Not ashamed to admit it. It's about seeing Jesus and it's about savoring Jesus. I mean, think about Jesus' own words in John chapter 5. He, he addresses exactly what I'm talking about. Look at John 5. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is that they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. You, you see what Jesus is saying there? You go to the Word because you want some good nuggets for your your daily living, but yet you forget that the very Word is about connection with me. How about the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3? And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord. Notice the word beholding. What are you doing? You're seeing Christ. We are being transformed when we see Christ into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. There is no change without beholding. Or in another way, you want to write this down. This this might be tweet worthy right now. There is no becoming without beholding. 
So we see Christ everywhere throughout Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, we see Christ. Christ is not absent from any part of the Bible. He is in every portion of Scripture. And when we see Christ and behold Him, we become a changed people. And when we see Him and behold Him, you know what happens? There's a savoring that begins to happen. You want more. I mean, how many of us have tasted something and been like, I'm going back there. I have like my favorite Thai restaurant, my favorite Thai dish. And guess what? You can show me all the other stuff on the menu. Nope, I'm not changing because I've tasted this. I savor this and I don't want anything else. Amen? Who wants to go out for Thai food later? It's exactly what Norm read in Psalm 19. Notice these verses. Notice the words. Why, why are we talking about this? Because the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Right? When something revives you on the inside, you, you desire it. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Now notice this. More to be desired are they than gold. Even much fine gold sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. I'm going to tell you right now, has anyone ever eaten honeycomb? It is awesome. And you sit there and go, oh my goodness. Like you look for those jars in the store with the honeycomb bit inside. And it's like, I get that honeycomb bit and I'm not sharing it with anybody. It is so good. So amazing. And yet God wants our spiritual thirst to be slaked by this. Like, have you been there? Have you seen that? Have you heard him? Have you seen him? There's nothing I want but him. This is what happens when the powerful nature of the word changes the disposition of your heart. Your desires change. That hunger is insatiable. And you are not satisfied in anything but Christ. It is a relational book. Why? Because God wants us to know him. I'm glad my wife's not here because I'm going to talk about letters from an old girlfriend. There was these things we wrote called letters back in the day. And I remember as a young hormonal teenager meeting girls at roller skating rinks and on Christian camp (laughs) retreats. Uh, Some romances lasted two, three days. Some two, three months. I never dated around. But when I did, (laughs) um, (laughs) one of my favorite things to receive, I wasn't necessarily a good letter writer myself, But one of the best things to receive from a girl that I was really interested in was a letter. And maybe I was just the romantic type that I'd get the letter, and before I even open it, I'd just put it up to my nose. Like, is there any fragrance whatsoever of this girl that has maybe made it to the outside of the envelope? I just stop and just smell it. And then I'd open it carefully because I didn't want to tear it. I wanted to save it. I wanted to put it in my little shoebox and save it with all the other girlfriend letters that were in there. But I tell you, you open it up, right? And you don't read it like an encyclopedia or a textbook. You don't read it as if like you're getting charged bill, your invoice for it. You're reading it as something from the heart of someone you care about to you. Right? And you, and, you, and you stop and you like read a word or you read a phrase or you read a sentence and you kind of let it just soak in. And then you proceed. And the whole time your heart's doing like these, this, these somersaults. You know, you feel the butterflies. You know, your, your blood pressure's rising, right? You're getting all sweaty. Your hands are getting clammy because it's like, someone's telling me something. It's not a Dear John letter. It's not a breakup letter. Those went right to the fire, just so you guys know. But it was the love letters. That at a human level, you know what? Gave me a little bit of a giddy up. 
how much more has the king of the universe sent us a letter to tell us about him, to tell us about us, and to tell us how much he loves us. Now, I'm not saying, you know, you know, it probably doesn't smell like anything. But I tell you what, you, you read something and you go, oh my goodness. Are, are you kidding me? He, he feels this way about me? I want to read more. Nicholas Sparks ain't got nothing on God, you guys. <laughs> you read this as if it is exactly what it claims to be, God's love letter to us. That doesn't mean the love letter doesn't contain things that maybe we would rather not read. But he does it with the aim because he loves us. And love tells us things not only do we enjoy, but things we need to hear. And we accept it and receive it as such. Amen? Number four, the Bible and spiritual living. Gandhi was the one who said this. Listen to this quote. He said, you Christians have in your keeping a document with enough dynamite in it to blow the whole civilization to bits, to turn a society upside down, to bring peace to this war-torn world. But you read it as if it were just good literature and nothing else. It's amazing when a non-believer shows us how important something is when we don't even see it ourselves. Five things the Bible shows us that ought to impact our daily living. Five pictures to illustrate, because God knows sometimes we need pictures and illustrations. Number one, the Bible is a mirror. You know what happens when you look into a mirror? It never lies. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? And what happened when she did not want to hear the truth? She just tried to destroy it, right? The Bible as a mirror never lies, ladies and gentlemen. James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Look what it says. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Back to what Jesus said, right? If you love me, you're not going to just hear me. You're going to obey me. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, he is not a doer. He is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks perfect into the uh, looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. I mean, one thing a mirror does is it shows you what hair is out of place. For some of you, you're thinking your head. Some guys are thinking their ear. Some of us are thinking our nose. You know, does you know how does this? shirt look and the mirror reveals right i heard what you said i'm ignoring it (laughs) because what does the bible do more than anything else it accurately shows us what our spiritual appearance looks like there is no other instrument by which god has given to us to show us what we look like John chapter 13, Jesus himself says this, if you know these things, blessed you are if you do them. Meaning there's got to be an awareness of what God reveals to you, and if you continue to ignore, there is this spiritual calcification that takes place. There is a spiritual desensitization that happens. How long will you continue to ignore and reject until it's it's the damning of your soul? That happens. Psalm 101. Love what the psalmist says. God bless you. I will ponder the way that is blameless. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. Meaning there are things we put before us that are damaging and destructive to our soul. 
And if we give those things preeminence in our lives, why do you think we are so joyless as Christians? We're, we're surrounded with technology. We've got our smartphones and our tablets and our Netflix and our Amazon. And we're streaming and we're looking. And the very thing we're neglecting is the very thing that brings life because all that other stuff does is bring destruction. Comparing my heart, my life, my family, my vacations, my accomplishments. I mean, I look at Facebook. I'm like, boy, I am not doing anything compared to all these people out there living their lives and they're so happy and they're so beautiful and it is a sham and it is a lie. All the things we put in front of our faces that we expose ourselves to do not lend themselves to walking in the integrity of our hearts. Only the word of God allows that to happen. The Bible is not just a mirror. It is a light. It enables us to see in the darkness of life so that we stay on the right path and avoid harm. How many of us have stubbed our toes in the dark? and been, ah! Right? The word is a lamp into our feet, a light into our path. Psalm 119. Great Amy Grant song. You guys going old school now? <laughs> Thy word is a lamp to my feet. Right? Yeah. So your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And he continues just a few verses later. The unfolding of your word gives light and imparts understanding to the simple. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the cavern of this world is dark and you better have a good helmet light. And only the word of God provides that light. Number three, the Bible is water. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. The water of the word satisfies like nothing else. This is why the conversation between Jesus and the woman at the well in John chapter 4 was so remarkable. Because here's a woman who had been married five times. Now she's sleeping with a guy she's not even married to. She comes out in the middle of the day to avoid all the judging and condemning stares of all the other women in town. She comes out in the middle of the day. She's at the well. Who happens to be at the well? Jesus! And they begin a conversation. The fact that he as a man is even talking to her is cultural breaking. And yet he talks about water to her. And she says, well, I'm here with a bucket. I can draw my own water. And he's like, you're missing the point. I'm speaking of the water spiritually that you have been trying to satisfy your heart with through your relationships with these deadbeat dudes that only I can provide. And when you drink the water that I offer you, he says, it is without end. How many of you want to drink like that? That the water never stops. It is the most pure, it is the most clean, it is the most amazing water, and it comes to you without end. And yet many of us, Jer Jeremiah chapter 2, we're trying to build our own cisterns, trying to build our own aqueducts to fill it with water, and the water we have is crappy water. And he says, the reason you are not satisfied is because you've neglected the cistern that I have made for you. That's why John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus says this. I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and who believes in me shall never thirst. He's the water of life. Which brings us to our fourth point, the Bible is food. I mean, look right there, right? Go back to 635, if you would, of John he says, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Again, the deepest desires we have as human beings is, is for food and for water. And yet these are the things that Jesus provides. Can I just tell you guys, we are to be nourished disciples. And I'm not talking about pre-digested food. Can I, can I tell you guys something? Like, one of the greatest things, and it's sad. It's great and it's sad. People will say to me, and I've heard this throughout 30 plus years of ministry. I can't go to church here anymore because you're not feeding me. Now, there's times I handle out with kid gloves. And then there's times I come out swinging. Nowhere in the Bible... Does it say it is the pastor's job to feed you? Anyone want to take me up on that challenge? You have to feed yourself. 
So what that person is essentially saying is, I can't go here anymore because I don't have time for the word in my own life. I don't want to discipline myself. I just want it regurgitated by you so that I feel fed. Good luck with that. Like we're a bunch of birds. Right? How disgusting is that? Like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> hold on, come here, Tom, come here. Blah! <laughs> Who wants that? Now it is the responsibility of us as a church to lead each other to those places where we can get down on all fours and feed for ourselves. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Why? Because he takes us to the purest of waters to drink and he takes us to the greenest of pastures to feed. I have a responsibility to help you see how amazing the restaurant of God's word is. Don't you come to me and say, I'm just not being fed. That's on you. Because here's the question. Who feeds me? All of a sudden there's silence. See, we have become too dependent on others. We surround ourselves with pre-digested meal because we just want something that's going to make us feel good, something I can send out a little social media meme about. And yet we lack the depth of feeding ourselves. Amen? That's a hard word to say. But it needs to be said. Matthew 4.4 4, Jesus says himself, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is right in context with him going to the wilderness and fasting for 40 days and being confronted by the enemy to tempt and test him. And what was the very thing Jesus used to strike against the, the word of God? My food is to do, do the will of him who sent me. That's Jesus. How about the word John 6, 3, 5? We already read it. How about 1 Peter chapter 2? Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Have you tasted the scene of how good the Lord is? You ought to be now growing out of infancy. Right? Some of you are so old in Christ there's no longer a need to be at your mama's breast. Amen? Hebrews chapter 5. No, that wasn't sponsored by La Leche League. Just so you guys know. For though this time you ought to be teachers, Hebrews is dealing with the maturity of the church, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. This is a word of condemnation and saying, church, wake up. Because your maturity, I mean, if it's 2,000 years ago, look at what's being said. What, how are we doing today? Last one on this point. Bible is a sword. I knew we'd go long today. But I knew you could handle it. The Bible is a sword. The only offensive weapon God has given to us when it comes to our spiritual armor. Isn't that interesting? You know, we have the, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, Ephesians chapter 6. But the only offensive weapon he has given to us is his word. And I'm going to tell you right now, it is so important because not only the external battles that come from without, but the word is also good for the internal battles that rage within. Can I tell you right now that Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17, here's what it says. Paul says that the word, uh, uh, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the only offensive weapon given to you, is essential because it defends us from the attacks of the enemy, but it also makes a difference in the spiritual battle that's raging in our hearts. Because while I may not be being attacked from without, tempted, enticed, you name it, there is still the struggle within. And can I tell you how real the battlefield of our heart is, especially when it comes to our identity in Christ, when it comes to our stand before God, when the enemy wants to whisper all these things about who we are in Christ or who we're not in Christ. 
I need the word to bolster the, 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 the weapons inside to say, no, I am the one that Jesus loves and that was who I was in my past. I don't want the enemy reminding me of my sin and my judgment and my condemnation because the gospel says I'm free of that. The gospel of Christ says I've been liberated from that. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason we don't live more liberated is because we're allowing the influence of the world to ransack our souls. We cannot afford to neglect the word, the very treasure, the very honey, the very gold that God says, wrap your heart in this. Because it's out of the heart the very wellsprings of life flow. But if I'm not protecting this and I'm allowing every voice and every opinion to, to speak, I lose my identity. And there's no joy. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. Look at this. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints, marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We need this. We need to allow God to speak and work. Okay, application time. We close with this. Three things. When it comes to spiritual application. We need a plan to meet. We need a plan to meditate. We need a plan to memorize. Okay? Three essential practices that I've probably just touched on briefly already in this message, but every word from God is given to you for your eternal joy. Don't miss out on this. So this is why the meeting is important. God's saying, I'm making an appointment with you. I want you to know how I'm, I'm there. Anytime you want to meet, my schedule's totally open. Don't you love that? You call the doctor. Like, my wife was so frustrated with the doctors, right? Because she's left message after message. She couldn't get in for it. And you feel frustrated, right? Because these people are important in helping you discover what's going on. God says, my calendar's wide open. You pick the day. You pick the time. You pick the length. But he wants you to know he wants to meet with you. And I'm going to tell you right now, we must have a daily meeting with God that is planned. I mountain bike three days a week and it is planned because if it's not planned, all other things will interrupt my schedule. You can find me on South Mountain on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday at 545. It's on my schedule, it's important, and oftentimes it's just me and God meeting in that place. But you need a plan. When's it going to happen? When are you going to meet the king of the universe? Because he's saying, ring, ring, hey, love to connect with you. Can we meet? Can we grab coffee? Can we do something? I love what D Moody says. He says, a man must, a man can no more take a supply of grace for the future than he can eat enough for the next six months. Can you imagine sitting down today saying, I've got to stock up for six months? Or a supply of air into his lungs at one time to sustain him for a week? We must draw upon God's boundless store of grace from day to day as we need it. John 8, 31, 32. So Jesus says, what? If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We need this daily. We need to have a plan to meet God daily. Like I said, I'm going to post social media. If you're not on Facebook or if you want, just me text me. You guys want my phone number? 480-390-4812. I tried to get 1-800-PASTOR, but it was already taken. So write down my number. If you want a plan, if you want me to send you a link, uh, get a plan. I know some of you like to read the Bible in a year. Some of you, January 1, I'm going to read the Bible this year. January 2, the plans failed. It's okay. It happens. Right? Don't be discouraged because the plans failed. Make sure the passion's there. We all miss a reading, especially when we get to Leviticus. I mean, who can get through that stuff? You develop a plan. If you need a reading plan, I'll post it on our, our Facebook page. If, if not, message me or email me. Get a good study Bible. ESV study Bible is fantastic. NIV Zondervan study Bible is fantastic. You need these things for you to go deep. You read for breath. You study for depth. And when you read, you meditate. That's the second point. You know what meditation is? It's sucking the marrow out of God's word. 
It's like tea, right? You take a tea bag, you don't dip it for a second and then take it out and go, oh, that's delicious. You let it steep. Because when you let it steep, you're sucking all the flavor out of it. What is meditation? It is not like Eastern meditation that requires you to empty your mind. Christian meditation says you fill your mind and what you fill your mind with is critically important. You fill it with the word of God. You fill it with the word of God. Joshua 1.8. Here's the smattering of verses. Here we go. This book of the law, what shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, right? Daily. You shall meditate on it so that you will be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, then you will have success. Who doesn't want that, right? Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight, right, heart, is in the law of the Lord, and he meditates on this law day and night. How about Philippians chapter 4, verse 8? Paul says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is anything of excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Stew on them. Meditate on them. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Can I just tell you, as you meditate, you're going to ask yourself probably three questions. What does this verse, what does this text say about God? What does this text, what does this verse say about me? Third question, what does this passage perhaps call me to do? Or call me to change? If this is truly a meeting with the Almighty and you know He's got your soul health in mind, what do we know about God? What do we know about ourselves? What does God call me to do? Don't always go to action. Can I caution you? Don't always be like, application, application, application. No! Start with devotion. And perhaps let it feed application. But don't just go searching for that nugget to say, I gotta get this to get me through the day. You go because the relational nature of the word says, I invite you to spend time with me. Amen? Last point is this. Memorize. Any of us can memorize God's word. How many verses do I throw at you guys like that I've committed to memory? I remember the first two verses I ever memorized. Hey, shut up. Go back to your car, all right? Second Corinthians 5.13. I love Gunther. It's hard loving him, but I love him. All right, so 2 Corinthians 5.17. For if anyone is in Christ, his new creation, behold, the old is gone, the new has come. First verse I ever memorized as a Christian. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives, it, lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. First two verses, identity. Anyone could do this. Don't tell me you can't memorize verses because I tell you what, you've memorized songs like I have, right? Mama just killed a man, put a gun against his head, pulled the trigger, now he's dead. Yeah. Right? Just a small town girl living in a lonely world. Took the midnight train going anywhere. Right? We've, we've committed so much to memory. We're not going to take it. We were, my son and I were listening to that the other day. And he knew all the lyrics. I'm a good dad, aren't I? <laughs> dad, who is this? Twisted sister. That's a weird name, yeah. Another story for another time. You're good at memorizing so many things. We're miserable at memorizing the word of God. If I gave you a thousand dollars for every verse you could memorize in the next week, you guys would get down to business. Am I not right? And yet the financial incentive should be nothing compared to the incentive of knowing and loving and glorifying our God. You're telling me you've got to be motivated by money versus a, a spirit of worship? Something is wrong. Memorize the word. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1. 
I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. John 14, 6. Those are softball verses. But do it. I will post on Facebook the 60 verses every believer should know. Will you memorize them? I'm not paying you, but I, will you memorize them? <laughs> will you find a partner for accountability and you memorize one a week? Guess what? In a year, you've got 52 verses in your belt that you can go to and you can pull out anytime you forget your Bible. Oh no, I just don't know how to worship God. I forgot my Bible. Well, guess what? You've hidden his word in your heart so that you may not sin against him. Proverbs, uh, Psalm 119 verse 11. Don't tell me you can't do it. And what's amazing is Jesus even said in the Gospels, I don't have the passage up here, but he says, don't fear about what you're going to say to somebody, but trust the Holy Spirit to bring to mind that which you put in within you. And I can't tell you how I've sat with couples, I've sat with men, I've sat with women here in this context, and they throw something out, and all of a sudden God brings up three verses that are pertinent to the topic, and right then and there, they are encouraged in the Spirit. Why? Because it's my wisdom, baloney, it is God's wisdom. And they sit there and go, where does that come from? I sit there and go, Psalms. Like, you're kidding me. Do not underestimate the power of the word. I've kept you guys long enough. You, this is something I'm passionate about. We ought to be people of the word, amen? My wife goes, you think there's a couple minutes at the end you can open up for q and I'm like, no. <laughs> no, I mean, look at, we got a clamoring cr crowd outside. They're on the verge of rioting. <laughs> Will you have a plan to meet? Will you have a plan to meditate? And will you have a plan to memorize? I will try to give you as many resources this week as possible. Email me, text me, let's link up on, on Facebook, something. But I will put out there those things that are going to help you in this journey. No other discipline is more important than the Word of God. Amen? Let's stand, let's pray. You guys are solid church, you know that. You guys are solid. Father, I, I love this community. Lord, um, I know this is, there's a lot here. And I'm sure like this morning, it's, it's probably like drinking from a fire hydrant. But this is where we trust your spirit to bring to our hearts and to bring to our minds exactly what you have for each and every one of us. For some of us, it may be the same. And for some of us, it may be different. But we're trusting your spirit and the word to bring about change and conviction and comfort and encouragement however needed you know God how to work it may we be men and women who love you and love the word that you've given to us so that we can become more and more people of the word thank you for loving us for giving us Jesus who is the word himself because in Christ there is joy and in Christ there is life and in Christ there is hope and remind us, Father, that to stray from Him is to stray from life itself. May we be people that hang on every word that has come from You. Thank You for giving us this great gift. To You be the glory. May Christ be exalted. And may Your Spirit have the freedom to work forever and ever. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. May He lift His face towards you and give you His grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Punch Gunther in the gut as you guys go out. All right. Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out the churchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.